Commissioner Mueller, welcome to Newsbreakers. Thank you for having me here. Congratulations. I appreciate being here. Congratulations. Thank you. So you've been with the department for 25 years, and you were the deputy chief for the past several. Correct. Do you plan on making any immediate changes to the department, whether on policy or procedure? Uh, at this point, there are not going to be any real major changes. You know, one, my management style uh, is one to look and listen and uh, make sure that all the decisions that we make going forward are correct. You don't do that well if you do it hastily. Uh, you need to think things through and make sure you're thoughtful and deliberative about things, and, and that's my plan uh, for now. And it's not like you haven't had a chance to see the department in action. Yeah, I mean, that's so correct. I just moved down the hall uh, <laughs> from, my, from my old desk to a, to a new desk, so it's really not that uh, drastic for a change. So I want to ask you about the drop in crime in Yonkers since 2011. It's a number that's been widely touted by the city and by the department. But I have to point out the crime rates are also down nationally, as well as in other big cities, including New York City. So. What's behind the drop in crime in Yonkers? Are, is it this national trend? Is it specific policies that have been implemented by the department, some combination? I think it's definitely a combination. Uh, nationally, as you say, Andrew, it, it, we have had a decrease in crime all over the country, which is a great thing for, for all our cities and towns and villages. Uh, more specifically, at a local level, I think we've been very, very efficient about reducing crime, and our strategies have, have worked. I personally am a big believer in precision policing. So if you, if you go back to the, the genesis of CompStat, it was really where we really started to think carefully and closely about uh, crime reduction strategies. I'm not saying that there weren't crime strategies prior to that, but uh, I was there at the beginning in New York City. I started my career as a New York City police officer in the 28th Precinct in Harlem. And I was there as uh, then Mayor David Dinkins uh, left office and in came Mayor Giuliani and uh, Commissioner Bill Bratton. And there was real transformative change. And it really came by the way of CompStat. Um, simply just looking at crime patterns, trends, offenders, and things like that. And I think that was a huge driver in getting us to where we are today. That, that reliance on data has led to other challenges in other departments. I want to ask you about that in a moment. But first, I'm, do you think Yonkers is a safe city? I absolutely think so. Yonkers is a safe city, yes. Do you think it's perceived as a safe <coughs> city by residents, but also by people outside of the city? I think that, you know, the, you know perception issues are difficult to gauge. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, in talking about crime reduction and statistics and things like that, I can tell you how many robberies we have. I can tell you where they are. I can tell you when they occur. Perception is a little bit different. I believe our residents feel that Yonkers is a very safe city. And... I don't have any reason to believe that people outside the city don't think it's safe. Is there any way to shrink that gulf between the perception and the reality? Or is that something that you just can't focus on? You, you do your job and perceptions will take care of themselves. I think that it's happening organically. I think, uh, you know, the, the work that Mayor Spano and his administration have done in terms of development and, and new construction projects and, and, and 4,000 new residences down in, in the downtown area would have been unheard of 20 years ago. And so we're going in that direction. People are moving to Yonkers. People are interested in Yonkers. New businesses are always opening up. So I, th I would say to anybody who had any question about it, come down and visit us. Stop by a restaurant. That's got to pose a challenge for the department. You have these new, for the most part, upscale developments along the water bringing in new residents, but then you also have the existing concerns of the city going forward. Is it is the same policing in all areas, or does it wind up, uh, do you have different policies or a different approach in, in those new neighborhoods? It's the same in all areas, you know, all people generally want the same things from their police department. They want to be, feel safe, and they want to be made secure, and they want to believe they can reach out to us for, for assistance. When we cover all those bases, we do extremely well, and, and we do it well. So what do you think are the biggest challenges to public safety I in the city of Yonkers? What needs fixing? I think right now we're on a, you know, I look at it a lot in terms of you can't look at things on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to look at trends. You have to look at uh, not necessarily, you know, yearly trends, but you have to look at monthly trends. You can't get yourself caught up in uh, one week or another week. You have to address things as they come, of course. I read a great article in the U.S. News and World Report one time about the Iraq War, and uh, it was really the worst time during the war when we were losing seven or eight or ten soldiers uh, per, uh, you know, per day sometimes uh, during the insurgency. And, and the author essentially said, you know, we need to think of things in macro time, not micro time. Mm -hmm. And I think if we look at our daily lives every day, things bad can happen. But that, you know, you have to understand and, and not conflate that with 
the, the big picture. So macro time is much more important to look at. Where were we 10 years ago? Where were we five years ago? Where are we three years ago? And where are we trending? And I think we're trending in the right direction. What, police leaders, police departments often talk about community partnerships to keep the streets safe. The police can't, can't do it alone. But relations often get strained in different communities between police and the people that they're uh, sworn to protect and serve. How would you describe the community police relationship in Yonkers and, and what are the challenges in improving that, the, that relationship? I think right now it's very strong and it's getting stronger every day. Obviously any police executive uh, or any leader in general would want always to have continued improvement. You know, you never rest on your laurels and you say, oh, okay, we've solved the problem and now we're good. There's always more work to be done, and there's a lot of very you know, easy strategies you can do to, to, to get there. And, and we've had a lot of tried and true strategies ourselves. It strikes me that there's the day-to-day -day community police relationship, and then there's the after an incident happens. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, the day-to-day -day community police relationships, how, how, does, how do you see that playing out? Is that the cop walking the beat, knowing everybody uh, along the route? That's a great question. And what what we're looking for in the day to day is to solve people's problems, is to find ways to help people that call us when they're in need. And that necessarily does not, especially in the recent years when we, we've had such a drastic reduction in crime, it's not necessarily always about crime. It's about quality of life. It's about loud noise. It's about littering. It's about illegal dumping. And when you're attentive to those issues uh, from residents, that's a great way to, to instill uh, confidence in, in your police department by residents. And that also sets the stage so that, God forbid, you should have an incident that divides the city to a certain degree. That foundation has been laid. I, I call it paying it forward, exactly what you said. So if you look at situations like Ferguson, Missouri, where a young man was shot and killed uh, and there were riots going on, but if you really you know, dig down deep into that situation, what you found was this was a community that didn't have a whole lot of relationship with their police department. And so when you're doing these things, you're absolutely right when you say that, when you're doing things in a positive way on a daily basis, you're paying it forward. And you know, you're, you're doing things where when something does happen, you are in a much better position to work with the community through a bad situation. I can tell you that, and I think we're all realistic about it, bad things are gonna happen. Our job and our goal is to handle it properly and do as much as we can in advance to prevent it. But if it does happen, we're prepared. You mentioned Ferguson and the community's reaction to that, as well as the nationwide reaction. We're also still dealing with the reverberations from the Eric Garner case in Staten Island, which was a, didn't involve a gun, but certainly a, another point of, of confrontation between police and, and residents. Is Yonkers doing everything it can to reassure residents should one of those moments happen? What percentage of your officers are wearing body cameras, for, for example? Is there a civilian complaint review board uh, that issues or, or concerns get addressed about the department itself? Yeah, we have a lot of internal controls that we do to make sure that we're serving the community properly and our officers are doing the things they need to do. Uh, we do have a civilian complaint review board. We do not have body cameras. Um, and, but that is a discussion that's been ongoing between the mayor and uh, the police unions as well as the city council. I have mixed uh, feelings about it in terms of its effectiveness. You know, anytime you use new technology, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, other people have jumped out early and done it, and it's been with somewhat limited success depending on what you read. So it's, uh, you know, it's something that, again, like everything else, as I discussed at the beginning of the conversation, you want to proceed slowly. If the decision was entirely up to you, if the, if the union wasn't a factor, if the mayor wasn't a factor, would you want all of your officers wearing body cameras? Does decision include cost? where I can't use the money for other things, because if it does, the answer is no. Let me, let me give a perfect, in a perfect world where money's not a factor. Sure. It's, sure. You think it does more, more good than harm? I think, yeah, I think, I think it helps. I think it gives, it doesn't give the whole picture uh, in some cases, some cases it does, but it certainly, you know, um, it, it eliminates a lot of doubt in a lot of situations. So in a perfect world, minus budget and minus other priorities, sure. I want to ask you, uh, while we still have time in this segment, there's a, a large immigrant population in Yonkers, and these are tense times for immigrant communities with the rhetoric from Washington, fears of ICE raids. Uh, how does the department, what's your message to undocumented immigrants in the city of Yonkers? Can they feel free to come forward, report a crime, uh, say that they've witnessed something without fear of being turned over to, to ICE or fear of being deported? Absolutely. That is absolutely our message. You know, we 
Uh, ICE has a, a job to do, and they do that job, and we do not work with them in terms of these raids. Um, and my fear is, and, and it's something I think that a lot of local police departments uh, feel, is that we don't want people to feel like if they're in need, they're afraid to call us because they're going to be reported to ICE. We do not do that. You know, we look at people as victims. We don't ask whether they're citizens or not. If they need our help, if they need the Yonkers police help, if they need help within the city of Yonkers, we're going to be there for them. Have you sensed a an increased reluctance among that community? to come forward and participate, uh, cooperate with police, that sort of thing, given the current climate that we're in? is it? I guess what I'm asking is, is that harming Yonkers right now? I, I don't know if it's harming Yonkers right now. I think we've done a good job of getting the message out that, you know, we are here for them, and we do not think in terms of who is a citizen and who is not. We think, as I said before, someone in need, how can we help them? And that's our main priority. So, you know, if we do that each and every day, people will be comfortable, I hope. Uh, I want to uh, jump in on community policing, which was something that we were talking about in the last segment. I'm curious how that works, but also the stats that you referenced, how you employ those, because I know uh, community policing and stat-based community policing was what led the New York City Police Department to stop and frisk, which was a controversial policy. How is it used in Yonkers? So let's, let's take stop, question, and frisk first. Uh, it is a, uh, an effective uh, crime approach mm -hmm. and it has been effective if it's used properly and that's that's a very important point to note um, you want to make sure that you're 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 in the right areas at the right times looking for the right people committing crimes I mean at the end of the day we don't want to turn this into a me another metric where we want to make sure that we have enough of them it's it's quality so I'll give you an example if we have a robbery pattern and we have you know seven people, all victims of the same robbery within one block radius, and we have uh, this occurring on Tuesday and Wednesday nights, and we have this all happening around 9 o'clock at night. Based on those, those metrics, we're able to drill down where the eighth robbery might occur, and so that's where it really works well. Um, there is a component of it, if it's overused, that really alienates the community, and we do not want to do that. So I think what you've found is this is drawn at least, especially me, into what I would refer to as a precision policing model. So what that is, is you're not, as much as we're focusing on crime, you're not focus, you're focusing on people. So if you believe in recidivism, and you believe that 10% uh, or less commit 90% of the crimes, and you're not focusing on those people, you're not doing your job. Now what does this do? Well, number one, we go after the people that are harming the community um, and committing crimes, but we're also not unnecessarily stopping and inconveniencing people that are not committing crimes. So it's almost like, like what I would refer to as a policing state of grace. You're doing all the jobs you need to do to keep crime down, fight crime, and make people feel safe. At the same time, people aren't feeling like you're there to, you know, be an occupying army. Is there a specific policy or a specific, I, I, I don't know, aspect of that, that that your officers abide by or have to abide by? Oh, to, make, to make sure that those numbers don't get used the wrong way, to make sure that that doesn't wind up stopping people who shouldn't necessarily be stopped. Yes, we're, we're constantly looking at the metrics of where the stops are occurring, what their relation are to crimes, and of course all of this is governed by the criminal procedure law. So th there's a number of different catch basins to make sure this is done properly. I want to ask you about gang activity in Yonkers. How big of a problem is it in the city? What approaches does the department take to reduce their impact? and, and is prevention on that on that scale too? Prevention is on the scale. We have an outstanding gang unit, and those detectives uh, use lots and lots of different tools to develop in, uh, intelligence on who's doing what to who, who's joining with who. Uh, social media is a big piece of that, um, and it's just a question of making sure that each and every day you're on top of all the people you know are involved. The more we know about gangs, the more we know about what they're doing and where they're doing, the better we can counteract them. And well. Uh, how much does the department know? Do you know what the gangs are in Yonkers? Do you know who's in those gangs? We absolutely do. Yes, we do. Okay. We and do. so that's just monitoring them or, or mm -hmm. tracking them. And if they wind up jumping the line, then... Certainly. And we also have, you know, there are also ancillary uh, groups that help us, too. We have a great program in Yonkers uh, called SNUG, which is Guns Spelled Backwards, where former gang members will go out, especially when um, there, there's a situation where we might uh, have heard that there might be violence or some retaliation, and these guys will also go out and try to 
quote unquote talk people off the ledge. What about MS-13? We hear a lot about them from the White House. We hear a lot about them on Long Island. Are they in Yonkers? Are they a problem? No, they're, they're not. They're, it's a largely a Long Island issue. It's not really too much of a Yonkers issue. They're not on our radar. I wouldn't go so far as to say there aren't any there, but as far as us, you know, and we're doing this work each and every day, paying attention, carefully paying attention to what's happening, uh, they're not uh, on our radar. So once you identify a, a gang that's operating in Yonkers, what, what can you do? I mean, is it, is it simply just surveillance and monitoring, or is it uh, these are people who are on your radar clearly for some sort of criminal behavior? Just being a member of a gang is not illegal? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's just watching and observing and watching and observing and 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 looking for criminal activity like anything else and if you can draw a nexus between the criminal activity and the gang that's also helpful for a criminal prosecution but you have to look at all those factors commissioner i want to shift now on to drugs there seem to be two school of thoughts on how to approach we just had a statewide decriminalization of low-level marijuana possession which sort of speaks to a if they're not hurting anyone why bother sort of approach that seems to be picking up speed uh, we've also got others who say you, you got to get tough on this and you can't, you know, zero tolerance on drugs. Where is Yonkers in its approach to drugs? We follow the law. And, you know, if the New York State Legislature uh, passes legislation to decriminalize marijuana, we're going to comply with that, especially after the governor signs it into law. You know, we have some concerns in the law enforcement community about how this is implemented. Uh, one is, you know, driving while stoned and things like that, sure. that, you know, th we don't at this point have, at least in, in, in a wide range, uh, tools to detect that as we do with alcohol. So that's a challenge. The other issue I've always thought about is the quality of life issue. You know, w all communities are not, one size does not fit all. So you may have communities that have broad expanses and there's two acres of property and people can enjoy smoking marijuana if they choose without impacting anybody else. In more dense uh, urban areas, it's more of a challenge because your, imp your behavior is going to impact somebody else. But as it seems as though the public sentiment is softening on, on marijuana, I'm just, is somebody, if somebody in Yonkers is caught with a small vial of cocaine in their pocket, are they going to jail for that? I mean, it's, it seems in the grand scheme of things when we're debating drugs and criminal justice, uh, it's still against the law, but it also seems like pretty stiff penalty to, or pretty stiff price to pay yes it, it all depends on the situation it's hard to to, to kind of you know play that out sure. without knowing all the factors but you know what I can say is is that we have not made a large-scale low-level marijuana arrest for some time and crime has continued to lower and go, go lower so you know clearly that speaks to me to say we don't need that as a strategy you mentioned quality of life, which uh, is also a touchy issue for a community and for a, a police department. Again, you don't want to let the little things go because that might manifest all the way up to major things and, and things might escalate. Then again, it can also lead to community resentment, distrust, claims of profiling and that sort of thing. Where, where do you strike that balance? I mean, y you do want to address quality of life issues, but at the same time, you want to sort of let people be. You do. And, and, and I think that's why we have three branches of government you know, in the larger conversation about the United States. We're not there to make the laws. Uh, we're not there to judge the law. We're there to enforce the laws that we're given. So a lot of it has to do, with, and particularly with uh, quality of life, is to see what the residents want and how they want us to handle situations. Some people may get resentment for loud radios, but I can tell you that there's a precinct commander somewhere who's at a meeting, and there's someone there that's saying, I don't want to hear this radio. Mm -hmm. So you do have to strike a balance. A lot of it has to do with just, y you're a mediator. You know, our officers now are out there mediating, trying to solve a problem, trying to get the yes between all the groups to make sure that everybody can live peacefully with one another. You're hoping that if that, if that example plays out, that the officer convinces the person to just turn the radio down. That's right. That's the best solution for That's everybody. That's the best solution for everybody. We don't have to, you know, not everything has to rise to the level of punitive uh, where we write a ticket or arrest somebody, if we can just solve the problem, we're happy with that. But then if they say, no, I'm not turning down the radio, then you've got to decide whether you're going to arrest somebody for a radio playing too That's loud. right. And, and if we have those tools available to us, we'll certainly use them because, again, like as much as people have a right to play a radio, there's also people that have a right not to hear it if it's too loud. And that's why we have laws like that on, on the books. As you may have heard towards the tail end of that interview with Commissioner John Mueller, we had a fire alarm go off in the studio, so we had to end our interview early. Our thanks and our apologies to...